Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Get, get, get that! Baltimore! What are they getting? Everything out of me. They gonna get a Super Bowl out of me. Need that. What is going on, you guys? It is Jake here bringing you all another episode of the podcast for this week. We've got a, a just a jam-packed week this week. We had the recap show, which was just me kind of running it solo last night, talking about the Ravens-Patriots game. If you still want a little bit of a recap, go back and check that out uh, after what was an awesome win on uh, Sunday up in Foxborough. Uh, on Wednesday uh, or Thursday, we'll, we'll see what we wind up doing with it, but we've got a very long chat with Glenn Clark over an hour that is really awesome. It's one of my favorite interviews we've done recently. But speaking of favorite interviews we've done recently, uh, got this fresh one coming up for you here. It's uh, between myself and Jonathan Ogden of the Ravens Ring of Honor fame of NFL Hall of Fame fame. He is uh, just the uh, one of the founding men of this franchise, really. So uh, definitely a bucket lister of an interview. He was really fun. Sat down with me for 20 minutes. So I wanted to sit down with you guys and record a quick opener here to just kind of preface it first and foremost. And also to let you know, you're going to hear Spenny uh, for the first minute or so of the podcast. And then his computer kind of randomly crashed or something. So uh, he was not able to sit in on this one, even though he planned to, unfortunately. So from there, I kind of just took the reins and it was just me and Jonathan for a quick 20 minute chat. He was joining us on behalf of PXG. Uh, so thank you to them for helping set this up. And uh, yeah, this was just a really fun chat between myself and Jonathan after Spenny popped out on us there. So hope you guys enjoy. And uh, without further ado, here's my chat with Jonathan Ogden. All right, we now welcome on uh, a very, very special guest. He is a Hall of Fame left tackle. He's the first ever draft pick in Baltimore Ravens history. It's Jonathan Ogden. How's it going today, sir? Going well, guys. How you doing? We are doing good. So first things first, you're joining us on behalf of PXG here. So before we get going, how about you tell us a little bit about what you got going on with them? Oh, man, I've been associated with PXG from day one. Uh, you know, Bob Parsons being a Baltimore guy and Patterson High School graduate where my foundation is, uh, we hit it off and, you know, they've been doing a lot of good things in the community and I've just been loved partnering with them and they got some great gear coming out and, uh, you know, what else can I say about them? They are, to me, the number one equipment in golf right now and uh, that actually helps my game somewhat. I actually went down a few uh, strokes in my handicap, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about that later. But <laughs> well, well, what's your what's your handicap sitting at right now, J.L.? Well, okay, my handicap has been as low as a five. Right now I'm hovering at about an eight. But I was up to about 11 before I got my PXGs, and I've kind of found something a little bit. So um, they're definitely, like, the best clubs out there by far. I would recommend them to anyone. Uh, but, you know, f golfers understand this. Your misses are just smaller with them. You know, you just don't quite miss as bad because it's a game of misses. You're going to miss, but can you keep that shot that wants to – if it should go 175, is it going to go 170 or 155? And that's kind of what the PXGs do for me. Yep. So uh, best clubs out there. Me and Rob Riggle had a great time out there doing a, a shoot for him. Uh, just Scottsdale National is a great place. They're just a high first class company. Yeah, they definitely are. And uh, we're both golfers here, so we like the sound of that. We might have to look into it. But uh, I guess we can jump into some Ravens talk here. And with you, I'm interested. I want to kind of go all the all the way back to the beginning here because I'm wondering, man, like what the hell was it like getting drafted to a brand new team back in 1996, <laughs> being their first ever pick? Was there a lot of pressure there? Was there was it maybe a little more freeing going somewhere without a, a ton of established history and expectations? What were kind of the emotions associated with all that? Yeah, I mean, um, basically, it was like, what's Baltimore? Who are who are the Ravens? I mean, it was like I had no real expectations, honestly. Because the night before the draft, all the Mel Kuypers of the world had me going to the Cardinals with a third pick. So the Cardinals were on the clock. We're in the green room. And the phone rings. And the guy picks it up. And I'm ready to stand up. I'm, like, kind of doing this stand up. And the guy says, uh, Simeon Rice. <laughs> so is that me? No, that's me. Sorry. Keep going. Okay. No, no. So the guy says, Simeon Rice. So I kind of start to sit back down as I started to stand up. Because I thought my name was being called. And then Baltimore was on the clock with the fourth pick. I didn't think they really needed me, 
But uh, Ozzy called up and said, you ready to become a Raven? I said, sure. I mean, we had no colors, um, no logo. But, uh, you know, I knew it was the former Browns. And I knew it was going to be a new city. So I looked at it as an opportunity to try to create something new in a new city and try to, you know, brand ourselves Baltimore's team. So I, I took it as a positive. You know, I, I met Ray Lewis before the draft. We had been on the same All-American teams. And when we drafted him with the 26 pick, I said, okay, me and Ray, we're going to go in there and try to create something, you know, try to set the, set a new standard for Baltimore. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I'm, I'm also curious, like, what it was sort of like, you know, new stadium, getting to know, I, I'd assume, Ted Marchabroda a little bit from there. What was that kind of, that whole scene like? Because it's really not talked about very much because you get Billick coming in there in 99. And uh, those first three years are kind of a, definitely a growth period. Oh, yeah. No, we were, if I believe, six and 10, six, uh, nine and one and four and 12, I think was our record. My first three years, if I'm remembering correctly. No, no winning records. Uh, Memorial Stadium, the first two years. Um, it was, uh, compared to new stadiums, a, a piece of poo. But, you know, uh, but we started to build something. Then that first year we struggled. But then, you know, you bring in a Michael McCrary and you bring in a Tony Saragusa. You bring in a Peter Boulware. And, you know, you start to see the pieces start to form. And then when, you know, you bring in a Brian Billick who kind of changes the way we view things in year four, year five, we win the Super Bowl. I mean, so it was really a, a fast growth, but it was kind of the first three years were definitely a learning curve, no doubt about it. And I think the fans kind of appreciated, you know, the fact that we came in and we fought and scratched and, you know, tried to become, you know, we kind of we grabbed that identity as a tough blue collar team in those years. They started in those early years. Definitely. And uh, yeah, it's funny because I was talking to uh, we, we had Glenn Clark on the show uh, the other day and we were talking to him about like. It was kind of like bootstrapping it as players a little bit to get fans to buy into it. Were you kind of a part of those efforts at all? Were you kind of like going out to, uh, you know, meet and greets and things like that in those days? What, what was that whole scene like? Oh, absolutely. It was a whole different way the town viewed the team because we we're so new. So we were definitely at a lot of events uh, out at the barn or any other places down in Dundalk. We we're out hanging out, meeting Ravens, Roost fans, just trying to introduce ourselves to the city. But you know what? Give Baltimore credit. They really appreciated us. Whenever we went out in public, people were happy to see us. And though we weren't great on the field, I could tell people were still loving the fact that they had a team in Baltimore again. And that made me want to win for them even more. What was kind of the first year where you guys went into it thinking, all right, we have to win now? Because like, I and I assume like it's <laughs> expectations are always a little bit different. And especially at that time, it was weird. And the media was even different at the time. So like, what was kind of like, was it when Billick came around or when was that? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, Ted got fired after year three, um, and Billet came in, and we kind of, I think we finished eight and eight his first year. And I think that next year, the year we won the Super Bowl, not that we felt like we had to win, but we felt like we really should win. You know, and we felt like, okay, we finished eight and eight this year, like the previous year, excuse me, and we have some good building blocks. We got some good young players, we brought us some good veterans, and we really should win some games. Now, a Super Bowl, you know, I remember, don't know if you guys remember the whole P word thing because we never been to the playoffs and weren't supposed to say playoffs and anything. That was kind of fun. But once we got to the playoffs, though, we we're like, we might as well go win this thing because we're here. So let's go do it. Yeah, that's an awesome sort of uh, anecdote of that season watching the one of the documentaries, I think, kind of goes into that whole P word thing. And I think that's pretty cool. And that's like, to me, it kind of smacks of Brian Billick a little bit. And like, I'm curious what your relationship with a guy like him for one and then a guy like Ray for another would be because you, you strike me as a little bit more of a cerebral guy. So what is kind of mm -hmm. your relationship with the more fire and brimstone type of uh, personalities like that? It always worked. You know, football is football. As long as you went out there on the field, you know, I'm on the field, I was kind of a crazy man, controlled rage. So as long as you could give me what I needed on the field, we're fine. And off the field, honestly, I got along with everybody. Uh, me and Ray were roommates for uh, our first year, rookie year, on the road. And uh, we got along great. Uh, it's just weird how football brings everybody together. Brian Billick is... <laughs> I love playing for Brian. And Brian is a very nice guy. He's a very good coach. Um, I appreciated what I appreciated about him most was the fact that he treated you like a man. You know, we had a set schedule, you know, we didn't, he didn't try to pull any tricks on us and he let us know what, how he was going to run things. And that's one thing I always appreciated about him. Um, you know, we didn't hang out and have beers, but I mean, Bill and Tom Brady didn't hang out and have beers either. So, I mean, it's kind of the way it is sometimes. Yeah, for sure. Was there a moment in the 
the Super Bowl season, and I, I think some of the defensive players have talked about this, but like, wait, was there a moment when you realized, all right, we really got something here? Like, it would it would it have been after the quarterback change, or what do you think? It was definitely after the quarterback change once Dilfer got in there. Maybe the San Diego game, uh, somewhere around there when we made the playoffs. But um, I think once we made the playoffs, we started to really believe. I mean, maybe some of us believed a little bit before, but we did kind of buy into the, hey, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's try to get there first. But once we got there, I mean, I think it was like, I think we all were kind of just waiting once we got there. And that's why when Brian Billick said, it's time is now, it's time to win a Super Bowl once we got there. I think we we're all just kind of waiting for that to get in and then go for it. Yeah, I think, and kind of going back to where you were sort of a the kind of premier building block of the franchise, was there a moment after you won it where you kind of step back for a minute, and this is kind of maybe just me fanboying a bit, but you, you step back and you're like, oh my God, I just went from like a nothing franchise and four or five years later, we're winning a Super Bowl. How cool was that? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I never won a championship at any level, so in college or high school. So when you get to the top of the mountain and you got, we are the champions clean playing and you realize that you are the world champion. It just kind of hits you like a ton of bricks. You're like, oh my God, I'm a world champion, a Super Bowl champion. And when you look, when I look back at, like you said, like, man, five years ago, we didn't have team colors. We didn't have a logo. We, we had nothing. And now look where we are. It's a testament to Art Modell, Ozzie Newsom, Steve Bashotti, all the front off, everybody in that organization. That's why this organization to this day is still one of the best because it's just, was started right and it's continued to be run right, run properly. Yeah, definitely. One, and I guess with that 2000 Super Bowl team, this is sort of my last question on it. Like, what is one thing, and we got the 30 for 30 coming up on it that I assume you're involved in. What is one thing that you think people should take away from the offense of that team? Because the defense, obviously, we kind of know the story at this point. It's great that they're getting a 30 for 30, but you as sort of the premier guy on that offense, what do you think we should remember about that? Wow. What do you remember about it? You know that we were part of the team also? <laughs> I mean, it's like... Uh... People ask me, do you know Ray Lewis all the time? Because they think about our defense so much. But, uh, you know, look, it's a team game. And so I definitely give 90% of the credit to our defense because they really did were one of the best defenses in history. But, you know, we ran the ball pretty good with Jamal Lewis. You know, Shannon Sharp made some plays. Kadri Ishmael made some plays. You know, Trent Dilfer did some good things. You know, we had some players on there. We weren't completely inept on offense. We kind of held our own at times that we knew where our bread was buttered but you know when, when it came down to it if we had to make a play we had a couple guys who could make a play just remember that we we helped we contributed to that super bowl win on the offensive side of the ball yeah you definitely did and uh i guess i'm curious from those couple years after like letting dilfer walk how did you feel about that in the moment and then kind of what was it like cycling through quarterbacks the next couple years after no, I, I still to this day feel that was like the one coaching slash front office decision that was really bad was to let Trent Dilfer go. I just felt like anybody who can win you a Super Bowl at least deserves a chance to fight for his job. You know, if they wanted to bring in Elvis, that's fine. But don't, you know, create no competition for Elvis by letting go of Trent. That made no sense. Um, and looking back at it, I still feel the same way about it. But, um, you know, hell, I, I, after... Gosh, I don't know how many quarterbacks. Because I played with a lot of quarterbacks before Trent. <laughs> I played with a lot afterwards. I think I played with like 13 or 14 in my 12-year career. And it was a little frustrating, you know, because the year I retired, Joe Flacco comes in and plays for like a decade straight. But, you know, it was what it was. I was always successful. We were always in the playoff hunt. Um, and we were always competitive. So, at the end of the day, whoever was back there, we were trying to get some wins. And they were good guys, you know, from Jeff Blake to – Randall Cunningham to, I mean, just <laughs> the list goes Anthony Wright, the list goes on and on. Chris Redman, you, you know, you get the idea. Yeah. Is there a feeling where like after, you know, you would want, it obviously doesn't show in your play, but is there a feeling of like, I've gotten over the mountaintop and won a Super Bowl, like, and now we're like cycling through quarterbacks again. Is there kind of like a, a, a weird feeling where you're just kind of, you're looking around like, all right, well, I already won the Super Bowl. What am I kind of doing here? Are we ever going to find this quarterback or? Well, a little bit. But at the same time, you know, you bring in a Kyle Bowl or you hope. You're always hopeful. But winning a Super Bowl does give you a sense of completion. Like, when I retired, I felt like I had accomplished everything that I could have on the field. You know, I had a Super Bowl. I had 11 Pro Bowls, all pros. So, 
you know, I know, I know a lot of guys who retired without that Super Bowl ring, and that really it, it bothers them to this day. And I don't have that bother, so I'm happy about that. Yeah, I bet. And you mentioned, you know, when you did retire, obviously after 2007, you had the toe injury that you were dealing with. But, you know, I'm assuming that there was some emotions associated with that because I think you probably presumably still had some gas left in the tank. And you can correct me if I'm wrong on that. But, you know, you step away in 07. And like you mentioned, Harbaugh and Flacco come in the next year. What, what were the emotions associated with watching that, you know, unfold right after you walked I was happy. away? I was, I was happy for them. Um, you know, I, I kind of wish I could have played a little more, but like I said, you know, my body was a little tired after 12 years. The toe was hurt. Had the toe not been hurt, who knows what could have happened, but it was. And I can remember my last year playing, I was so miserable because I was in the training room all the time, you know, and I just couldn't perform. People were bull rushing me on the field, things they would never try because they knew I was hurt. So at the end of the day, I said, you know, I'm thankful that this injury didn't happen in year two, it was year 12. And I had a complete career. And like I said, 11 Pro Bowls, the Super Bowl, I said, you know what? I'm good. I can just walk away now and feel good about myself. And that's what I did. So were there specific moments where you were on the field where you're like, all right, this is really starting to slow me down? And like, is there a specific player that you remember giving you a ton of trouble? Not a specific player. I do remember being, <laughs> we were out at Seattle. I forget what week it was, near the end of the season. And we're coming out of a TV timeout. And the, that 12th man is going crazy. I can't hear myself thinking. I'm looking around the field, looking around the stadium, and I thought to myself, I really don't feel like being out here right now. <laughs> and, well, and, I, and I said, whoa, hey. And I, and I, I slapped myself around and said, let's get it going. But when I said that in my own mind, I said, man, it, it's just time to really go. I mean, I just – because I wasn't having fun. I wasn't enjoying it. I wasn't performing at the level that I know in my mind I should be performing at. And it just wasn't enjoyable. And so when, when you're not enjoying it and you can, then walk away. Is, so is that when the relationship with golf starts to develop a little bit, I'm thinking? <laughs> well, the relationship with golf started to develop slightly before that. That's probably, I'd say, 2004-ish, you know, three, four-ish or so when I moved out to Las Vegas. But uh, that's when I really got intense on it. I probably never got below a 19 handicap when I was still playing. But uh, once I retired, I, I started focusing on getting myself down. Yeah, I bet. I bet. And yeah, it sounds like you're killing it. Um, what do you make of where the sport has gone since he retired? Because it was kind of almost right after that, that this new passing boom started up with Brady and Rogers. And now you've got these freakish athletes at quarterback and everything like that. How do you feel about the state of today's game? And how do you think you might hold up in it? Oh, I'd be fine in today's game. Um, it, I think it's way less physical. I mean, I think you can get a penalty for hitting somebody a little too hard, feel bad for defensive players, and you know, roughing the quarterbacks. But I appreciate the way the game has opened up, the way you got more athletic quarterbacks, the way the offenses are just very innovative, and even defenses as well. Defenses started to get innovative when I was playing with Rex Ryan, but uh, they've even evolved from that. I think the state of the game overall is good. Uh, I'm glad they're getting rid of the Pro Bowl because they really made a mockery of that game last year. Um, but one thing about the NFL, they're going to try to find a way to make a dollar. So I know, <laughs> you know, whatever they're doing is for the benefit of the, of the game. So. Yeah, definitely. And I guess we can uh, talk, you know, close you out here with just a couple questions on the current state of the organization. You know, you've stayed involved in the last couple of years being in the booth mm -hmm. and whatnot at certain points. What is kind of your overall feeling on where things are? Do you consider yourself a big fan or what? what, what is your kind of current relationship with the Ravens? I am a fan ambassador. You know, I, uh, I still do some things with the organization. Uh, I go to the home games. Uh, I go around representing the, and going up to suite level and saying thank you to people and just saying, you know, the Ravens like me to come up here to say hi and thank you. Um, but I think the current state right now, I, I'm, I'm to be decided. I'm still, the defense to me right now is a little, there's a question mark. One thing I do love is Lamar Jackson right now. I wish he had got his deal done, but it is what it is. But I mean, this first three games, he's been unbelievable. Um, I, you know, as long as he stays healthy, we got a shot. You know, if he's not there right now, we're, we're going to struggle. But uh, I think overall, I like where we are. I think that Miami loss was kind of hopefully a wake-up call. And hopefully we can continue to do some good things. I mean, I think the North is up for grabs. I think we can beat both the Bengals and the Browns. So, uh, you know, I just, I'm just excited to see what, where we go from here.
Yeah, definitely. Me too. And I, it's interesting because Ronnie Stanley reminds me a lot of you, I think not only mm-hmm. as a player, but in temperament as well. What is kind of your relationship with him? And, uh, I'm not asking you to like break anything on his status or anything, but, uh, no, no, no. Me and Ronnie are very, we're close. I, I, I check in on him from time to time. You know, we talked about, I told him, I said, don't go out there until you're ready. I mean, uh, my son goes to the same high school that Ronnie went to out here, Bishop Gorman. So, uh, I remember following Ronnie even when he was in high school and then went to Notre Dame. Um, great talent. I just hope he gets healthy. And that's the one thing I told him. I said, man, if you don't get healthy, that would suck. But make sure you're uh, just be right before you go back on the field because he didn't look good last year when he played the Raiders and he, because he wasn't ready. If we can get him back because we need him because uh, the youngster, uh, Lele, I think is his name, if mm-hmm. I'm pronouncing it properly, he, he's not ready to be left tackle right now, not ready to start. And looks like Makari, I don't know what, what his injury situation is. So we really could use Ronnie. Um, I think that will really do wonders for our offense, and hopefully that will get the running game going because that is another thing that's struggling. You know, if J.K. can stay healthy and Gus can get back. So, you know, there's some question marks out there, but overall I'm, I got a positive outlook. Definitely. And I, I guess I'll close you out on a, a, what I hope is a fun one here. How about you go ahead and give me a Mount Rushmore top four quarterbacks that you played with in your career? Oh, that I played with? Whew. Boy. A lot to choose from. <laughs> there, there are. Um, I would say Trent Dilfer because we won the big game with him. I'd say Vinny Testaverde. You know, Vinny was amazing that, that my rookie year. Steve McNair, the late great, um, was just a warrior. And who would the fourth one be? I mean, if you want to go historically, I'd probably say Randall Cunningham because Randall – did not while he was with us, but he did some great things in the NFL, obviously. And Randall was a first class individual. I mean, he's just one of the nicest, most genuine people I've ever met. So I'll go with those guys. Nice. That's a good list. You had the hot run there with Wright in 2003. I thought you might throw him in there. I, I'm a- yeah, A Wright was, was good. A Wright was good, but just not quite. Yeah. Hell yeah, that was another good one. I mean, I love Kyle Bowler too. And I always feel that Kyle Bowler gave you everything he had. It's not his fault he was a first-round draft pick. If he had been like a third or fourth-round pick, people would have viewed his career differently. But because he's a first-rounder, they view him kind of as a bust. I view him as a guy who gave us some good effort, some good times, but just not quite enough. Yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, I guess we can uh, close you out there then, and people rightfully think of you as a great player and a Hall of Famer and a Hall of Fame guest on this podcast. Thank you for hopping on, man. It was a ton of fun. Why don't you go ahead and uh, plug PXG one more time before we get you out of here? Hey, everyone out there, Jonathan Ogden here, go get your PXG golf clubs. You know what? Nobody makes a better golf club out there, period, as uh, Bob Parsons would say. Yeah, those great commercials, they get me every time. So, uh, (laughs) yeah, thanks a ton, Jonathan. This was great, man. Absolutely. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age?